obvious that if a government wishes to control its people and make sure they do exactly what they're told to do, they have to monitor their people. They have to know what they're doing uh, at all times. We may soon find ourselves living in, in, a, in a nightmare that I think would uh, even George Orwell couldn't have anticipated as to how much control we're putting into the hands of um, you know, government, uh, large corporations, and people that perhaps we can't trust. If you're talking about wars, if you're talking about uh, money management, if you're talking about orchestrating crisis, these people behind it sounds like a conspiracy. Every day, in so many ways, we are being watched. We're told that it's for our own good, for our own protection, to make our lives better. But is it? I'm Grant Jeffrey, prophecy expert and author of over 26 books. I spent two decades researching and detailing how our fundamental freedoms are being systematically eroded, how our governments are not controlled the way we think they are, and how all of this ties into remarkable prophecies from over 2,000 years ago. Until recently, all of this would have been considered science fiction or the ramblings of conspiracy theorists. But each of the technologies you have just observed either already exists or is being planned on a drawing board somewhere. The evidence is all around us. There is no denying that we live in a surveillance society. And really, no matter what we do, there is no turning back. There is a desire by, many, by several forces coming together who do want to add a biometric identifier to um, government identification. So the, the, leading, the leading push in the United States is most likely a biometric added to your driver's license. That biometric is most likely going to be a fingerprint. Under that model, the fingerprint becomes your new social security number. So what does that mean? Well, I'm touching the chair, I'm touching the table, I'm leaving my fingerprints behind. You come along with a piece of tape and some dust, you pick up my print, you stick it on a, a, a fake ID, and now you're me, <laughs> right? As proved by this phony fingerprint that you just lifted up, right? And then if, if things get really bad with your identity theft and social security numbers, you can actually get a new social security number. But what do I do about getting new fingerprints? I'm always forgetting my wallet. <laughs> and then I can't find it and I don't know where it is. And the idea that maybe someone could put an RFID chip somewhere where I would just have to wave my arm. It's a very attractive proposition. There are plenty of reasons, I think, to be worried about a cashless society where we have microchips implanted in our hands and simply make our payments in that way. Uh, for one thing, you would be unable to ever make a payment or make a purchase that someone wasn't watching and recording in a database. Marketers would love to get a hold of that. Hackers can hack into that. The government could use it um, you know, to, to, to investigate you or try to control your behavior. Understand you know, how money works and how the only real way right now we have of hurting them is through money, which is one of the reasons they're trying to create a cashless society. Because as long as you and I have cash, we can eat. And as long as we can eat, we're free, at least we can defend ourselves. When you take the cash away and you create credit cards and then you create microchips, what you're doing is suddenly, you know, we become the whim of the powerful people. They can punish us by pressing delete three times on the computer screen. And suddenly $10,000 turns into $10. One of the most important developments in the, this privacy area that's come with the digital revolution is that Orwell's picture of loss of privacy, the government watching us, the surveillance cameras everywhere, certainly is true to some degree. There are surveillance cameras everywhere. There's a push for every nation on the globe to identify and number all of its citizens. We're seeing this happening in China, where you've got over a billion people that have now been issued unique ID cards, literally uh, national ID cards with uh, radio frequency devices in them that can be used to track them and identify them at a distance. You're seeing now it's happening in Mexico. They're going to be doing national ID cards to all of the citizens in Mexico. 1.2 billion people in India about to go into a database. Um, virtually every country on the globe. You know, I go to the doctor, I have a lab test done, my blood is there, uh, they sequence it, they know something about me, but they also know something about my family. 
And even if I agreed that they could use it for research, to what extent did I now bring my family release information about them? This is an RFID credit card. Um, there, there have been tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of these issued. And the vast majority of people who are carrying them don't actually realize that there is RFID in them. There's nothing on it anywhere that says RFID. There's a small symbol on the back that if you know what it means, you'd know that it was RFID. But if you're just looking at it, it's just another logo. You, you have no way of knowing that there is an RFID chip in it. The problem with this is that because you don't know there's RFID in it, you won't take any steps to protect it, which means that I can come along with a device like this. I bought this on eBay for about $200, and it reads these RFID credit cards. It gives me full card information that is sufficient to, to process a credit card transaction. So using my $200 device, I've got all of these people walking around with all of these credit cards in their pockets that they don't know have RFID and that they don't know are vulnerable to off-the-shelf devices like this that can read their credit card information and then conduct transactions with their credit card without that card ever leaving your wallet. If everyday citizens don't stand up for their rights, then a big government will take more and more of their rights away from them. If everyday citizens don't stand up for their rights, then a big government will take more and more of their rights away from them. Everyone should be concerned about this because this affects them, it affects us. None of us uh, are exempted from what's happening in the world today. This affects our lives, our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives. And if we really care about anything, anybody outside of our own skin, if we really care about other people, about society, about our nation, about the world, we'd better take an interest in what's going on. So if your phone calls, your letters, um, if the contents of your homes, um, the contents of your automobiles, the contents of your computers are open to surveillance by the government or by uh, private entities who share that information with the government, then I think it's going to be very, very hard for most people to be free in the way they live their lives. If we get to the point where the government is watching everything we do, then we're going to see some serious erosions of our civil liberties, our right to assemble peaceably, our right to free speech, our right to free religion, uh, free practice of, of the religion of our choice. All of these rights are going to be eroded through these technologies. The saying is, if you put a frog in cold water and then you put the heat on, the frog will gradually warm up so he won't know to jump out and he'll be boiled to death because it's such a gradual Thing. Now, I don't know if it's true of the frog, but I can pretty much tell you it's true of the population because I'm watching it happen. I think surveillance and tyranny or surveillance and the loss of freedom really go hand in hand when you look at other civilizations, other societies over the years, you know, all the way up into you know, the 20th century. There is this really strong link between autocratic or despotic or excessive government power and at the same time all sorts of surveillance mechanisms whether they're secret police or national ID cards or other kinds of mechanisms that are designed to make sure that people are being watched and perhaps even more insidious that they know they're being watched. Won't all this surveillance and technology make us safer from crime? won't, isn't it a good idea to watch everybody and monitor what they do? If that were the case, then you should be able to look back and say, okay, well, let's look at the most monitored and surveilled people in history. And arguably, that was the Soviets living under the Soviet Union, under Stalin, and uh, the, the folks who came after that. Every phone call could be listened to. Every piece of postal mail could be opened. If you had a, a party at your house, you wouldn't know if government informants were attending the party listening. You know, after all, if you have nothing to hide, why would you care? But the Soviet Union under Stalin was the most deadly regime in all of history. And in fact, under that regime, with all of that watching, 60 million people perished. 60 million people were killed by their own government, by the very government that was supposed to be protecting them. You know, the bad guy might today be Al-Qaeda, and it might tomorrow be you know, fundamentalist Baptist. Back in 1968, George Ball was the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs with, uh, uh, with JFK and Johnson. 
at the meeting in Montreal in Canada, in Quebec, he said, uh, how can we create corporations that shall one day give orders to governments? And that's what Bilderberg is all about. It's not one world order. It's one world company limited. Highly organized uh, uh, agenda to break the back of the American free enterprise system because it stands in the way of uh, those that have a globalist agenda. And uh, so, and they're succeeding. And so the, uh, backed by big money, backed by the trade unionists, backed by the multinational corporations, they're all playing that game for their own reasons. Increasingly, our utilities are under the influence of people from other parts of the world and other governments. Most of our main industries are now a majority foreign owned. Few Americans have any idea of this. And the powers that, the, uh, that own our major industries, for the most part, favor globalization and world government. So they are, I would say, a, a big part of, of this um, uh, drift toward world government. The main event is the, the wholesale destruction of, uh, of the world economy. Are you saying to me that Joel the Plumber is more intelligent than David Rockefeller? If he's lending the money, the question is why? So you destroy the economy and you destroy the wealth of the people because, again, uh, you destroy the wealth of the people, you destroy the power of, 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 of growth of nations and, of course, the population base. I believe we are just one major world crisis away from having a totalitarian type of system in place. Um, our indebtedness here in the United States is now approximately $65 trillion in foreign obligations. It's way beyond what most people realize. It can never be repaid. And because the United States has presented a, a, a specific challenge to globalists, uh, because the American people have always been an independent, freedom-loving people, so how do you get the United States into a global government? Well, ultimately, you have to crash their economy and make them so dependent on foreign powers that you can blackmail them to come into a system. The, the thing about this is you have to you have to have a crisis big enough for the public to be able to uh, accept whatever the solution is. It, you know, it can't be a half a big crisis. It's like Rahm Emanuel said a few months back. You know, the last thing you want to waste is a good crisis. Every time we turn around, there's a new crisis. There's an economic crisis. There's a war crisis. There may be a pandemic crisis. There's a crisis everywhere you look, and. As long as people are in this crisis mode, uh, they're not very uh, vigilant about uh, watching what's happening to their liberties. Uh, all they're thinking about is, oh, government, do something, protect me, save us from all of this. And the government says, yes, that's exactly what we intend to do. Every time there's a new war or a threat of war, there's more motion in the direction of merging our military with other national military forces through the United Nations, so-called peacekeeping forces. So all of these crises lead to more legislation, more treaties, uh, and a more uh, movement in the direction of giving up our sovereignty as a nation, merging with a global structure, and the creation of that global structure into a totalitarian system. If a one world occult system comes into place, I believe we will entirely lose our freedoms to, to speak out, uh, to worship freely as we will, um, to own property as we do now, uh, I believe much of the world's property will be seized by the coming global government in the name of protecting the environment. Um, our health care system, if someone controls uh, our health care, to a large extent they can control us. They can determine whether you